go to jail. Do you understand? He did not have to go to jail. Well, he gets out on probation in 10 months. Listen, that's not all my fault. You know I don't like those penny any cases. I was doing you a favor. Favor? What kind of favor? It's nickel and dime, Arthur. It's all nickel and dime. Don't you care, Warren? Don't you even care? Al Pacino is a compassionate lawyer fighting with a fellow attorney in the new drama and Justice for All. It's one of five new movies we'll be reviewing on Sneak Previews, two critics looking at the new movies in town. And across the aisle from me is Gene Siskel, film critic of the Chicago Tribune. And this is Roger Ebert, film critic of the Chicago Sun-Times. Now, in addition to Al Pacino's movie, which was made in Baltimore, we're going to be reviewing films from three foreign countries. From Germany, a new version of the Dracula legend, Nosferatu the Vampire. From Italy, Luna, the story of a violent and sexual relationship between a mother and her son, and from Canada, a terrific bank robbery picture of the silent partner. But first, Roger begins with an American disaster film, Meteor. Gene, it's kind of a toss-up whether I want to begin with this film or go out and get a sandwich. <laughs> Meteor is without any question the most hilariously incompetent disaster movie that I have ever seen, and that does include Hurricane. <laughs> now here's the disaster. A gigantic meteor is heading straight for Earth. It's five miles across. It's speeding through the cosmos at 30,000 miles an hour. And if it hits Earth, it'll dig out a crater roughly the size of the United States of America. Now, that sounds pretty bad. And in this scene, <laughs> American astronauts get a close look at the meteor, a real close look. effects. Now, I've seen better planetoids on Roger Ramjet. <laughs> Looks like they spent a couple of days out on the back lot with a used camera, a bag of rubber rocks, and a 49-cent watercolor set from Kmart. Well, what happens next? A space scientist, Carl Malden, recruits another space scientist, Sean Connery, to help him destroy the meteor by blasting it apart with American nuclear missiles, which are already orbiting in space. You originated Hercules. Well, I've cut it out, Paul. I know how you feel. But dredging up old feet... I don't have to dredge up nothing. I can taste it right now. Now look, it wasn't my decision to turn Hercules turn into... Hercules into what? What did they turn it into? Will you listen to me? Hercules was never designed to be a nuclear weapon with 14 warheads pointing right down on Russia. Not only Russia. Or China, what the hell else? Those rockets were supposed to point outwards, not in. It's meant to defend us against the same damn threat that we're facing now. Wait a minute now, didn't I yell at them? Yeah. Didn't I stand up for you when you walked yes. out? Well then listen to me. Will you listen to me? That meteor is five miles wide, and it's definitely going to hit us. We'll make a hole big enough to put the Atlantic in unless we can stop it. And then, what will you do? What will you do? <laughs> I think we said enough about meteor gene, but that's not going to stop me from saying one more thing. I want to describe one great scene. Now, smaller meteors go on ahead. You see, one of them wipes out the Swiss Alps, and just before it does, the movie shows 12,000 cross-country skiers, and it's not fake footage. I mean. These are really 12,000 cross-country skiers, but do we see the 12,000 skiers as they are hit by the meteor? No, we don't. Well, why not? Well, because the movie has a newscast on it. The announcer says, fortunately, our cameraman escaped in a helicopter just moments before the disaster took place. Well, that's terrific <laughs> disaster footage, right? If they're just going to show future victims, why not make it a real disaster? Why not show the Boston Marathon or the Super Bowl just moments before the meteor hits? It's awful. Yeah. It really is. The name of the game in this kind of a picture is we want to see things blown apart. We want to th see things destroyed. We want great special effects. This film is being billed as some sort of expensive movie. I saw it. I didn't see where the money went. It's a cheap, 
uh, playing with blocks kind of special effects. After Star Wars, after Close Encounters, we want real stuff. We don't get it in this picture. What you get at the end, you know, considering the fact that this meteor is going at 30,000 miles an hour, which is fairly fast, they have at least an hour for it to keep coming while they rip off other disaster movies. Mm -hmm. People are caught in a burning building, towering inferno. They're caught in a flooded tunnel under the city. That's earthquake. I was waiting, waiting for the attack of killer bees. Yeah, they should have taken all their money and put it into one great special effects instead of dribbling it out on this garbage. Now, a complete change of pace. We're going to switch to the serious new film by Bernardo Bertolucci, the Italian filmmaker best known as the director of Last Tango in Paris. His new film is Luna, the often shocking, often merely confusing story of an American opera singer, Jill Clayburgh, whose husband suddenly dies. The new widow takes her teenage son to Rome on a concert tour. They both have emotional crisis. She discovers her son is hooked on heroin, and that triggers a sexual episode between them. At an outdoor birthday party for her son, Jill Clayburg embarrasses the boy. She's despondent and drunk. Mom, oh, it makes me want to cry. Hey, Mom, come. Come. Mom. Later in the film, the relationship deepens between mother and son. She takes pity on the child and his drug habit. They have that sex sequence together. He later responds by fixing her a special dinner. They're drawing closer to each other. Style soup. Candlelight. Fancy. Fancy. You now have 19 minutes and 45 seconds to get dressed. 19 minutes and 45 seconds. A troubling sequence. Luna does involve some powerful emotions, the unspoken feelings between parents and children, but the film is needlessly obscure. What's it really about? Well, it's got a lot of subjects, the generation gap, the impotence of an artist, a teenage identity crisis, a kid searching for his father, incest, drug addiction, life with a jet set. Well, that's too many subjects for one movie that never really figures out what it wants to say about all those subjects. We walk out of the pictures and we say, what was it about? We do, and I think that's very disappointing because we go in with high expectations. Bertolucci sure. is a major contemporary artist. He's one of the best Italian directors. He's made a lot of the best movies of the last 10 years. But the list that you just uh, mentioned sounds like uh, possible subjects for a series of soap operas. Mm -hmm. I mean, and there are a couple of subjects you left out that he has in the movie, too. Now, there are two ways to really deal with this kind of ragged material. Either you can make it into a soap opera, one of those trashy pictures like the Greek tycoon, or what Bertolucci is trying to do, I think, 
make it operatic. You know, the subjects are larger than life, and so are the characters. That would be great. The subjects are certainly larger than life, but the characters never really come to life. That's the big problem. We don't care about those two people. Oh, their problems are sad, but they're not very likable people, and I'm afraid we think they're sort of spoiled rich people, and we really don't care about their problems. Also, one other thing. Uh, the picture is being touted a little bit because of the sex sequence between the mother and the son. Well, it's no real big deal in the picture, and if anyone's going because they want to see that scene, it's not much, I'm afraid. It's, t it's more touching and sad than it is erotic in any way. Right. I think this movie is really a disappointment. One thing about the next movie that's interesting is that it has, in a sense, and it's a movie I like, the same failing that Luna does. It has too many subjects, and the movie never pulls them together. But where Luna has characters that we don't care about either, this movie, and Justice for All, survives because it does have a central character that we do care about, and he does pull us through the movie. It's Al Pacino, and he plays a Baltimore defense attorney who discovers that his life and his career and a lot of his cases are all going to pieces at the same time. Pacino isn't one of your standard young reformers who graduated from law school yesterday. He's going to change everything today. He's not like that. He's been a lawyer for 10 years, and he knows the ropes, but the daily accumulation of small frustrations begin to wear him down. And one of his clients, for example, is totally innocent. He knows it, the client knows it, everybody knows it, but try telling that to the judge, especially if the judge is John Forsythe, who didn't like Pacino in the first place. Judge Fleming. I want to apologize to you, sir, for my, my behavior in the court the other I day. I don't want to hear your apologies. I don't want to hear anything you have to say. Well, that's understandable, sir. It's just... It's just I thought that maybe we could discuss this McCullough case, you know, you and I, man to man, off the record, sir. Look, if you're going to try to make a deal with me, you might wind up right back in jail. A deal? Deal? No, no, sir, I'm not trying to make a deal. Look, sir, I can understand your strict enforcement of the statute, but what I can't understand is that my client's constitutional rights are being don't denied. Don't the law to me. My client is Personally, innocent. I don't give a damn about your client. Judges like that are always so nauseatingly self-righteous, they almost get off on the idea of some poor innocent slob rotting away in jail, and that's okay just as long as nobody can say the judge wasn't following the rules. But it turns out that this judge breaks the rules in his private life. The Forsyth character, and we love these moments, he's arrested and charged with beating and raping a young girl. Lee claims he's innocent, and of course, as his defense attorney, he hires Al Pacino. He figures it'll look good if he's defended by a lawyer who's known as his enemy, but just as Pacino's girlfriend walks in on the closing argument to the jury, things start to get sticky. The intention of justice is to see that the guilty people are proven guilty and that the innocent are freed. Simple, isn't it? Only it's not that simple. However, it is the defense counselor's duty to protect the rights of the individual as it is the prosecution's duty to uphold and defend the laws of the state. Justice for all. Only we have a problem here. And you know what it is? Both sides want to win. We want to win. We want to win regardless of the truth. And we want to win regardless of justice regardless of who's guilty or innocent. Winning is everything. That man there wants a win so badly today. It means so much to him. He is so carried away with the prospect of winning, the idea that he forgot something that's absolutely essential to today's proceedings. He forgot his case. He forgot to bring it. I don't know. I don't see it. Do you? I have witnesses for my client. I have character references, testimonials that are backed up from here to Washington, D.C. I got lie detector tests that have been checked. Objection! Objection to state. Sit down, right? Mr. Kirkland, you are out of order. You're out of order. You're out of order. The whole trial is out of order. They're out of order. Basically, I think we've seen that scene somewhere before. The angry man blowing up in the face of the establishment. Jack Nicholson, who went over the cuckoo's nest. Peter Finch and Network. They're all fed up. They're telling the world where it can go and what can it do with itself when it gets there. And justice for all tries to do the same thing. It tries to do it with a mixture of drama and comedy, and unfortunately, the drama and the comedy don't really fit together in this movie. 
It twitches tone so often and never finds a strong central story that it wants to tell. But I have to say, there's still a lot of good stuff in here. Al Pacino is filled with an anger that's very compelling. He keeps us interested. He draws us from the beginning of the movie to the end, even if sometimes we don't really quite know why. A major disagreement. I think this is one of the year's worst films with a major star in it. It's a bad film for a lot of reasons. But basically, it takes a subject, the American legal system, and it plays cheap with it. It gives us a world with bad lawyers, bad judges, and one good guy, Al Pacino, who every 15 minutes blows up and starts <laughs> screaming. And he, Roger, the public is very familiar with the problems of the legal society. We all know about cases that don't come to trial for years. We all know about crooked judges and all that. This film gives us cardboard characters, and we're supposed to feel, just because we see corruption, it's like the filmmakers okay, are saying, okay, hey, yeah. look, it's corrupt. Now, don't you feel bad? Okay, on That's the, not drama. On the basis that you're criticizing this film, I agree with you. It is not a successful reformist film. It's not going to change the courts. It's not going to change the fate of one person sitting in jail. I don't think that's what the movie is about. It seems to me that's the occasion for the movie, which is basically just an entertainment. I sat there. I enjoyed myself. I liked the Pacino character. I liked some of the humor in the film. I liked some of the drama. Period. You call it entertainment, but Cuckoo's Nest was about a real world, mental illness. Network was about a Those real world, television. Cuckoo's Nest and Network were better pictures. Much better pictures. I never thought I'd say this, but I think that Al Pacino in this film, for the first time in his career, is actually boring. He repeats himself uh, from pictures like Serpico, where he was the only honest cop. He's yelling, well, Serpico again. The police, a real world. This picture is not in that category. I'm disappointed in I found him boring. Okay, I give it a modified uh, recommendation. You certainly don't. Okay? No, I give Let's it a go real strong no. Let's get on to the next Few one. Few things are more satisfying <laughs> to film critics than disagreeing like we just did. And also, in <laughs> spotting not heavily publicized films that turn out to be real jewels. And I think we found one. It's called The Silent Partner, a Canadian bank robbery picture in which Elliot Gould plays a bank employee who uncovers a bank robbery scheme a couple of days before the heist is pulled. Gould decides that he'll steal some money himself at the same time as the robbery, blame it on the thief, no one will be the wiser. It all works okay except for one thing, the thief, Christopher Plummer, really gets ticked off because Gould didn't give him all the bank's money. So the movie then becomes really about Christopher Plummer's attempt to steal the money from Gould that Gould stole from the bank. And so Plummer tells Gould he wants the dough in a phone call to Gould's apartment. If you have something to say to me, say it. Otherwise, I'm hanging up. Oh, no, don't hang up now, pal. I'm running low on dimes, and I just have to come up there. That's all, and I don't want to do that. Not yet. Now, first, we're going to try to talk things over reasonably. All right? Now, come over to the window. Kind of remarkable, you know that. I, I don't know how you managed to pull it off. Well, I guess you're going to have to tell me one of these days. <laughs> but we uh, we worked it together, didn't we? Uh, I mean, we we ran the same risks, didn't we? We're uh, we're partners. I'm going to call the police. Uh, what are you going to tell them? Besides, you see this. <laughs> Nice level of tension there with Elliot Gould's best performance in a number of pictures. Well, Silent Partner is a brutal, R-rated, but always very stylish battle between these two men. The Silent Partner was not made by a major studio. It's a film that may only pop into your town for a couple of weeks. You'll have to move fast to see it, but I think it's definitely worth it. This is one of the freshest bank robbery pictures I've seen in a long time. I'm really in agreement with you. Basically, if you want to see a good bank robbery picture, this is the picture you're looking for. It has what you want in that kind of a picture. It has a great good guy and a great bad guy. Neither one is boring or one-dimensional. It has a neat way they get the money. It has a love affair that's romantic and poignant and kinky, whatever you want. And at the end, it's got a really unprepared for twist. I mean, what happens in the last 10 minutes of the movie is mm -hmm. delicious. So I enjoyed it. I don't know why it's been neglected. Well, what happened, I think, is that the film company that had the picture, it did not 
do so well in box offices in the first couple of cities that mm -hmm. it played in. So they think, well, the whole country won't like it. Well, this part of the country likes it. <laughs> it's being responded to by critics all over the country, I think. This is a film for people to see. If they get behind it, if you support it, it can play for a long time, I think, in any city in the country. Okay, now how you're going to know it is it's called Silent Partner. <laughs> it stars Elliot Gould, and the ad is going to be very small and says for one week only. But <laughs> go to see it, right? Yeah, you can another, make it more. Another kind of a genre picture, bank robbery pictures, you get about four a year. We also seem to get about four vampire pictures a year. And last summer, we had two big hits starring Dracula. We had George Hamilton, who made Love at First Buy, and we had Frank Langella, who played the Prince of Darkness in Dracula. But now comes fall, dying leaves, longer nights, <laughs> and from Germany, Werner Herzog's new film, Nosferatu the Vampire, which is one of the most stylish and sympathetic versions of Dracula that I think I've ever seen. Klaus Kinski stars as the tragic and bloodthirsty Count who invites a real estate agent over for dinner. There is a feeling there, and the way that vampire comes across that I'm telling you is there in the whole movie. It makes mm. this a different kind of Dracula movie. But all the same, I kept waiting in that scene for the great line from all the great Dracula movies, I never drink wine. Anyway, <laughs> this new version mostly follows the basic materials of the Dracula legend. It plays them pretty straight. It goes more for the underlying tragedy of the vampire's fate. And you can sense that here when Count Dracula tells the salesman what he's looking for in a house, in life, and in love. Der Tod ist nicht alles. Es gibt viel Schlimmeres. Können Sie sich vorstellen, dass man Jahrhunderte überdauert und jeden Tag dieselben Nichtigkeiten miterlebt? Ich freue mich, dass Sie ein so großes, altes Haus für mich gefunden haben. Sie sagten, es lege ganz in der Nähe Ihrer eigenen Wohnung. Ja, eigentlich ist es nur schräg gegenüber. Ja. Lassen Sie den Vertrag sehen. There's a great feeling there. He's not just a bad guy. There's a sadness there, too. Nosferatu was a great movie to look at, a great movie to listen to, and Klaus Kinski makes a convincing Dracula. He's haunted, he's brilliant, he's doomed, he's pathetic, and he's savage when he's cornered. But Nosferatu isn't a movie for creature feature fans. We ought to make that point. It's too slow, too serious, and never really scary enough for that audience. So sorry, go to another movie. This one has elegant beauty and a solemnity that's really very touching. I think I that's like right. It. It's elegant. I felt as, almost as if I was seeing Dracula for the first time, the real Dracula, a Dracula of legend, a Dracula that could have lasted in literature and created and maybe existed in time somewhere and may exist now. You do feel he's sad. Most Draculas, it's a simple power show. The guy's tough. He sucks somebody's blood. You try and kill him. This film, it's lyrical. You feel terrible about this guy and yet he has to be destroyed. So it's a, a sadness that exists in the world. I think it's a terrific picture. It is a little slow. People may see it. They'll say, hey, they could have taken 20 minutes out of it. I think that, too. If you can last for the 20 minutes, I think it would be a very special film for people to see. How about some special films not to see? This is Spot the Wonder Dog carrying out once again his fearless mission to sniff out and destroy <laughs> the Dogs of the Week, the week's worst movie. Well, Roger, my Dog of the Week has a title guaranteed to bring a smile. Would you believe... <laughs> Wait till I tell the title. Would you believe <laughs> Disco Godfather? I suppose it could be subtitled The Corleone Family Catches Saturday Night Fever. 
Actually, Disco Godfather is about a black disc jockey, Rudy Ray Moore, who attempts to rid his ghetto neighborhood of drug pushers, selling lethal doses of the drug known as angel dust. But that goody-goody story turns out to be just a cover for a lot of violent action, a few horrible dream sequences, and a couple of disco dance scenes in which Rudy Ray Moore continually yells in a microphone to the dancers, put some weight on it, put some weight on it, put some weight on it. And then once in a while for a change of pace, he yells, put some weight on it, right? Could have been in the picture. Actually, what could use some weight is the script of Disco Godfather, which, seriously speaking, really exemplifies the sorry state of American films featuring black people. Gene, I think we're going to have to put some weight on my dog this week. It's a combination would-be disaster movie and would-be thriller <laughs> called Avalanche Express, and anyone who can figure out what this picture is about ought to get a medal. It seems to be about an assortment of American, German, and British double and triple agents who take turns murdering and betraying each other while their train races toward and through avalanches, <laughs> survives collapsing bridges, and also savage guerrilla attacks. But it's not. I don't know what it's about. Avalanche Express has the usual assortment of walk-on stars. Everyone in this movie seems to have been hired for three days, and nobody seems to have read the entire script. It's a shame that this was the late Robert Shaw's last film. Thank goodness he's going to be remembered for a lot of other good movies. Then there's Maximilian Schell, who seems to know he's in a terrible movie, but valiantly pretends to be having a good time. Now, how bad was this movie? Remember Meteor, we talked about it at the beginning sure. of the program. That one was at least bad, but it was fun. This one is only bad. All right, we'll skip that one. I hate those pictures with lots of stars, but nothing else. So much for the dogs. Now to recap our reactions to the main movies on the show, Roger and I agreed on four out of the five pictures. We both hated Meteor, rated PG, a film full of cheap special effects. That's why there's a no next to both of our names. We recommend you avoid being hit for three or four dollars <laughs> by Meteor. And we can't recommend the Italian drama Luna about a violent and sexual relationship between a mother and her son. It's beautiful to look at, but also tedious and confusing. Two no's for Luna. We disagree on the Al Pacino lawyer film and Justice for All. Roger thought it was well acted and entertaining. He says yes. I thought the film was one of the year's worst. Very patronizing. I say no, even for diehard Al Pacino fans. We both admire Silent Partner, a fine bank robbery film, but see it soon before it disappears from your town. Two yeses for that, and two qualified yeses for the German Dracula movie Nosferatu the Vampire. Parts of the film are slow, but its mood and fresh approach to old material is truly exciting. We like Nosferatu a lot. And that's it for this show. Next time on Sneak Previews, we'll be back with reviews of five new movies, including Yanks, a love story of American GIs in England, Running with Michael Douglas as a lonely long-distance jogger, and a new thriller called Legacy. Till then, see you at the movies. Funding for sneak previews was provided by this station and by other public television stations.